Mark Benecki, forensic biologist and Germany's only publicly appointed and sworn expert for biological traces. Mark is also an author, chairman of the Pro Tattoo Association, a state chairman for Germany's Departei, and much more. This is the first of a two-part conversation with Mark about the science of crime scene investigation. What tools and methods are used by investigators to extract information from a crime scene? What does training look like for budding crime scene investigators? Does one ever really grow out of their disgust sensitivity for blood, violence, and decaying corpses? How do wealth and power influence the criminal justice system? And do juries really understand the subtleties of forensic science? This is a good one. I hope you enjoy. Escaped Sapiens. I wanted to start, well, eventually what I want to do is I wanted to get into the science of what you do. And I also want to talk about the justice system in general and your, your opinion on whether it's fair and those sorts of things. But before any of that, I want to get an idea for who you are as a person. And so from my naive perspective and from the perspective of an outsider, when I think of forensic biology, you know, the first thing that pops into my mind is that it has to do with death and murder and sex crimes and these sort of grisly aspects of human nature. But when I was researching for this interview and I was looking at, at what you do, I, I sort of I got the impression that you're more focused on life than death because you, you focus on things like the, the insect life that develops at a crime scene. And you're also in your personal life, you're involved in politics and art and all, music and all sorts of uh, things like this. So has has your experience and your work as a forensic biologist sort of shaped and sculpted your view of uh, life and relationships and, and love and, and your place as, as a member of humanity in, in any particular special way? Uh. Well, when you talk to relatives um, who survive, you know, or has either survivors of a crime case uh, themselves or the, the relatives who are left behind, and that that gives you, of course, a, a certain perspective on some aspects of life, especially what people can endure and um, how strong and focused they can be and especially uh, how scientific they can become uh, out of emotion. So because usually you would think if somebody is caught into an emotional affair or a, ca a crime case, then people... Um, won't think correctly and will be just trapped forever in rage or hate or, or sadness or something. But that is not the case. Most of the people who are really pushed over the border um, really start to think scientifically, at least the ones that we see. I have to I have to add, obviously, everybody else is not going to consult a scientific uh, forensic office. But the ones that we see are very um, focused. They start to um, bring us evidence. So, for example, they pull out, um, you know, pieces of wood that contain blood or they bring us uh, underwear containing hair, uh, sperm, skin cells, etc. So from working with those people, I really got the perspective that much of the, yeah, <laughs> of what bothers us in daily life is really just a joke. And I'm not even talking about concentration camps and so on, because I, I do some research on that, because I wrote the biography of a very old, um, of a person I knew, and he was a, he was the director of the Institute for Legal Medicine in Eastern Berlin. And obviously he was in the war and related to Oh, he saw war crimes and stuff. So I'm not even relating to concentration camps, war, atrocities, genocide. I'm really just talking about the, the daily crime that people just have to live with for the rest of their lives. And it could be a sex crime, as you mentioned, which will, which will never you know, leave your mind and your and even your body because it can somatize but it could also be something much more severe like the death of your child that you you know just pull a decomposed body um you know <laughs> you pull it out of out of some basin of water and you have absolutely no idea what was going on and you're the, under the impression that nobody is helping you and nobody's following your leads because you're just a regular person and um sometimes socioeconomically not challenged but really fucked and um, people un in such situations often get the impression that nobody's helping them so um, yes it, it did shape a little bit my view on what real day-to-day -day pain is compared to what people complain about 
So you, you are approached by family members uh, to investigate certain crimes. It, it, is that how you become involved primarily in cases? Or Yeah, uh, nowadays, uh, my, my first internship was 30 years ago, so <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> But um, uh, and, and even then, private people approached me because I was the only one at the Institute for Legal Medicine in Cologne in Germany where I was uh, doing my internship at that point. And later, I also did my PhD thesis there. Um, they everything that was weird or twisted or even oddballish or or just boring or strange, they would always say, "Go to Binecki, he's going to listen to you. We don't have time for that." So even at that point, um, I was consulted by private people, even though I was at the Institute of Legal Medicine, where usually uh, private requests were mostly brought. At that point, um, th these were mostly paternity cases. At that point, the private cases, everything else was not dealt with if it came in privately, because they could always say, "We don't have time for that. We we prefer to work for the DA's office, you know, for the for the prosecution or something." But paternity cases uh, softened that a little bit because that was obviously a big. A resource or <laughs> mode of uh, income for the director, at least of the institute. <laughs> um, but late, but nowadays, uh, 30 years later, I often work for private people because in Germany um, we are the only office that is officially, or I am personally officially sworn in and certified as an expert for biological stains. But also, I'm the only one who can really work neutrally in the positive sense. Um, because nobody can uh, uh, put pressure upon our lab or upon me because we, I mean, we don't earn money anyways. It's, it's not, we, we are dealing on the lowest possible level of uh, income that you could uh, even imagine. And at the same time, there's nothing th that they can take away from us. And um, some, so that, that makes it very attractive for private persons to approach us because they don't suspect us to be yeah, biased in any way. And, and they are correct. We are not. So even if you come from organized crime or if you're the richest, wealthiest, healthiest, cleanest and most beautiful and straightforward person on planet Earth, I, I would listen to both of you. So, so how is your lab funded? What, what's special about your lab in particular? How is it funded? How, how, how is it run there? Subsistence, to be honest. So um, my, my co-worker um, or my co-workers, they, they get, well, the, the salary is okay, but I, I don't get a salary, for example. So I don't pay myself. And um, we just work mostly like in Germany, um, we have these little shops on every corner of the street called kiosk or, or it's a Späti. You know, they're open all the time and you can buy whatever you want. They're like, like toilet paper, schnapps, uh, <laughs> sweets, <Yeah>. etc. <laughs> and we work like them. We're just open, uh, open every day, 24-7, 300, whatever, <laughs> 65 days per year. And from that, um, we, we just see whatever comes up. So sometimes... Articles are paid very rarely, but sometimes they are paid. For example, if it's a book for an editorial house, the scientific articles are not paid, obviously. But um, sometimes we we just ask people how much money they have. In most cases, they don't have any. But once in a while, they can pay something. But at, it's just subsistence. That's it. I see. So early on, so 30 years ago, when you were looking at paternity cases uh, to a large extent, was so that was fathers who wanted to know whether the child was theirs and they wanted you to go investigate and find DNA samples or what, what was, what was that? Now that, that, no, that was just the reason that our, bio, that the biological lab existed because in the, at the Institute of Genetic Fingerprints were invented by Alec Jeffreys in 1984, 1985. And that was pu very, very, um, published in a very highly ranked uh, journal, either Nature or Science, so one of them. So it was really, it was a total breakthrough. Um, and then he he was not so very much interested because he thought it's very applied because he's a human geneticist. So he didn't set up any patents or set up his, his own labs or anything. He just gave it away. Um, the whole method and everything and, and technology. And then soon some uh, companies uh, came up. But some institutes for legal medicine, especially in Germany, Münster and um, Cologne, they came up with the idea that you could use the technique um, for 
um, insane cases. Obviously, people in England and the United States and American or English speaking countries uh, also did their thing and the people in France and so on. But, but Germany was really very early on involved. And the institute in Cologne had a basement. And in this basement, um, this was uh, full of tiles. So everything was full of tiles. So you could keep it very clean and tidy. And that was good because when you're working with DNA, then it's good when you work in a tidy environment. These were the former stables for the apes that had been used for research, like to shoot them or to strangle them or to hang them or to expose them to radiation. But that was not allowed anymore. So, so all the rooms were empty. And then they just asked biologists to come in, which was very unusual because the Institute of Legal Medicine, the Institutes of Legal Medicine are usually driven by uh, medical uh, doctors and not by biologists. So, but down in the basement, it worked. And the, the source of income and why it really was something that the medical people were interested in was were the paternity cases. Because at that point, you could only solve paternity cases, for example, especially the question, am I the father or not? That That was the main question at that point. But you can, of course, also ask, am I the mother? Is this my child? Is is the second child really the genetic uh, sibling of, of my first child, etc.? So you can yet ask everything. But they came up with the idea because they were already um, close to criminalistics and the police was running around at the same time in the same basement, by the way, because <laughs> the corpses were there too and the police people. So uh, it mingled a little bit. Insects, corpses, DNA, genetic fingerprints, police, mm -hmm. biologists. And um, I was not... Um, involved in the paternity cases. Personally, I did the stain cases because paternity was really more or less a routine thing and also a thing to generate money and to, yeah, to allow the whole topic to find a place inside of the, in, of the field of legal medicine. But I was more the nerdy guy um, looking, for example, my PhD thesis was about um, old urine. So how, how can you get DNA out of old urine stains? <laughs> so that And was, can we? Yes, yes. It was quite interesting because I had to get the old urine stains. So I was running around at the institute and ask for volunteers for urine stains. Um, and at that point, it was good that we were already the strange people from the basement, the biologists, because everybody was like, okay, better give them what they want because they are going to pester you and annoy you if you don't give them. So we got a lot of urine samples and also um, there were Olympic Games <laughs> in Atlanta at that point. And we we also got urine samples of, of uh, all the sports people who were using doping substances. And that became very interesting because they said, well, there might be a doping substance in my allegedly my urine sample here, but it's not my urine sample. You cannot prove it's my urine sample. Somebody, you know, switched the, the jars or the glasses. And then we came in as the DNA people and we're like, well, but your DNA is in the same urine sample. And that made it a little bit more complicated than to um, claim that it was not their urine, <laughs> even though they found ways out of those situations like all criminals do, but... I'd never, I'd never thought of that. Is, is, is that done routinely now? That sort of analysis? Yeah, I think to today, I think they try to solve it more diplomatically. For example, by um, stating that they were using a substance that was not forbidden at that point. You know, to to avoid the whole technical thing, because um, they are a little bit afraid that this may be very substantial and hard evidence. So usually they try to drag it on the juridical side and say, yeah, it's possible. Wow, super sorry. But, you know, we, at, if, if you look in the law, you know, we applied this substance on June 30, but it was forbidden only since July 1. So super sorry, but legally we are on the safe side. I think that's what they do now, <laughs> preferably. <laughs> So is so is there a lack of expertise in so I, I know there are body found places where they uh, analyze the decomposition of, of uh, bodies in the United States for example but in in Europe is 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 there a lack of your expertise is is this why you're also why you're personally sought by um, private people well you know I mean in our field there's always a, le a huge lack of of everything lack of prevention for example when it comes to suicides um, we have in, in germany suicide if you are younger than 25 years of age 
then suicide is either on on rank place one or, or rank two of the, of the kinds of types of death that occur. So um, it's very frequent. So 600 uh, kids or juveniles kill themselves every year in Germany alone and 10,000 uh, persons kill themselves every year in Germany. And it's not a big country. So that's a lot. And, you know, we were like, let's talk to teachers and to kids just about the problem to distinguish between mood swings and actual depression or um, about parents who really neglect, neglect kids or parents who are just actors, professional actors and just have a very liberal lifestyle, you know, and that's not neglect <laughs> necessarily, but it's just fun, maybe. And um But it doesn't work. So prevention in that area is very difficult because usually the schools are like, oh, no, you can't talk about that. That's too rough, mm -hmm. you know. Then, um, of course, you have all the people, the the so-called invisible people. I call them invisible people. It's not a technical term, like uh, drug users, people with mental illnesses, but also mm -hmm. with personality disorders or all together. <laughs> it all comes together once in a while. And they are just invisible. They die at home and they just decompose and somebody finds them or not. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, they will be found. Okay, but uh, Messies, um, people who who are just socially very retracted, like people with schizoid pers personality disorder, n not schizophrenic. That's totally different. Just schizoids, so they just sit at home. Sometimes they are computer nerds, but sometimes they don't have any social contacts at all. So nobody knows that they live in the house sometimes. And... Um, in all those cases, usually nothing happens when it comes to criminal investigations because the police says, hey, we don't know anything. We don't even know if the person has enemies because we don't even know if the person has any social contacts. Mm. So, I mean, the person is decomposed. We don't see any signs of a crime, but that doesn't mean anything because if you don't look, then obviously you won't find any sign of a crime if the skull is not cracked or suicide cases in which um, persons or, or even homicide cases in which persons allegedly are uh, robbed or assaulted in a foreign country. And then it's a matter of the police's, police departments cooperating. For example, in Germany, when I have cases in Spain, then usually I go there, I find very interesting stains, but then the German police tells me, If it's a case relating to German citizens, they're like, okay, but th this is still a case for the Spanish police. Because if you as a German are uh, slaughtered in Spain, then it's a case for the Spanish prosecution and Spanish police because we Germans don't have a juridical um, right to, to enter Spain and work there. So in many cases, just nothing happens. And, you know, and so there's always a lack of everything in our area but that's that's unavoidable also um final a final example we have ca um, court cases and then a few years later you get a, a stain wise i'm i'm only talking about hard evidence not about thinking nobody is allowed to think in our lab thinking prohibited so um we have hard evidence that the crime did not happen as it is written in the final statement of the court It's it's uh, because we have an oral statement of the court and then a written statement. It, it is a German thing. And the written statement is uh, more detailed. And the written statement sometimes is like a novel. It's as if somebody was there and a drone and the drone observed it all. This this has to do with our legal system. So we know very we know we know very precisely what the assumptions and the yeah Yeah, assumptions, I would have to say, in many cases of the court were. And then we just find out they, it can, it, it is impossible that it happened like that, stain wise. Mm. And in such cases, you can't do anything because, um, in many countries, once, um, whatever the court decided is decided, this is final. And no matter what you find out later, there's nothing to do. This is different in the United States and Australia and uh, England because they have a different, legal system and many people who watch uh, cinema movies think that once you find out uh, new evidence then you could easily start uh, the trial uh, new but I personally in my practice I had that situation twice in 30 years mm -hmm. that the trial was really begun 
new upon the arrival of uh, new evidence. In all other cases, somebody in the judicial system said, nah, it's not enough or nah, 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 you know, so something. So what was, what was special about those cases? Was it that the people were particularly wealthy or was there, was there what, what was it that made those stand out? That's a very wise question. In the first case, the person who was killed was the sister of a DA, of a prosecutor. <laughs> that was the first case. Or I would have to say that was not even a case in which um, in which the whole case was started in you, but it was a case in which special evidence was used. So that's that's uh, something related to what we were talking about. And in the other case, it was a very good lawyer mm. who um, invested a lot of time into the whole case. Yeah, that was this. Mm. So this this seems like a sort of a crazy system that you can't. Re can, can I ask, when there's a case in in court, do, do do the jury, in your experience, often not have a good understanding of the subtleties of the forensic science, and do police do police themselves also not have a very good understanding of the subtleties? Uh, they have a different understanding. They they are more. The police is uh, which which I like is very much sleeves up. So they would they would come to our lab in former times, especially in summer when there were a lot of decomposing people because it was warm and humid and a lot of insects were running, flying around, crawling, etc. Um, they would just give us cases to check what comes out, and then later check if what we found out matches what they found out with their real police work <laughs> out, of, out of their view. And that was very good for us because it was good training for us and it was um, a very uh, trust-building experience for them because they saw that even without any additional information, we came to conclusions that um, matched the, let's call it the pattern, the criminalistic uh, space-time pattern that, that emerged for them. So the police is just sleeves up and they will use whatever is helpful. Um, we don't have juries in Germany. Um, and this, um, again, even though we don't have juries, I can talk about juries too, but the subtleties are never a concern because... The Germans are very German when it comes to the law. So they would always say, well, you know, this is not about right or wrong. And this is not about fairness. And this is not about good and bad and evil and so on. This is about application of the law. End of story. And um, so, you know, this is like the very much the humorless, uh, dry style that you would um, expect Germans to uh, have. And they actually do have that. And they, they even state that in the court. Many people, including me, have heard uh, a judge saying, you know, we just apply the law and we are sorry. But uh, whatever your expectations were here uh, concerning justice, especially, uh, <laughs> that's not our concern. And... But if if they are a little bit younger, the, the older judges would obviously not say that anymore. Mm -hmm. And concerning juries, when I worked in Manhattan um, at the chief medical examiner's office, which is also an institute for legal medicine, but it's under the um, un it's it belongs to the mayor's office. So I was employed by Giuliani <laughs> of Trump fame. He was he was the mayor of Manhattan at that point. I liked him, I have to say, because uh, my, my final paycheck was not paid to me. And then I wrote him a letter and I got the money. So I'm, th I'm thankful. My, I'm thankful for my final paycheck. That, that was his office. So there's also, he also does good things. Um, and the juries in the United States are very often composed of people who are interested in CSI movie like facts. But um, when it comes to statistics and so on, you you literally see them sleeping. I, I personally saw members of juries falling asleep. And then since I was not the a lawyer or any juridical person, I would like whisper and ask, say, is it allowed to wake them up just very k kindly and, and friendly? And they're like, oh, good God, no, don't talk to them. If they sleep, they sleep, you know. You just <laughs> don't whistle, don't snap your finger or anything because that's going to be for the trial because then you're influencing something. Okay. So the uh, juries... <laughs> that's a little are, bit terrifying, are, actually. Uh, it, if if <laughs> So especially, I mean, if people... Uh, forming their opinions of cases based off CSI, and I guess in Germany, it's you've got the Tartort Reiniger, which is the equivalent, uh, probably. Um, 
it, how, accurate, how, how accurate are these depictions? Are they, in your opinion, are they sort of rubbish or do they, do they touch on things at least a, a little bit realistically? I have absolutely no idea. The last thing I saw was um, The Silence of the Lambs. That was in the 1990s, a movie with Jodie Foster. And um, that was more realistic than it sounds or it seems probably to some people who watch it because... Um, you, you do have the enthusiastic young, let's say, FBI special agent, police woman, policeman. What you know, it could also be a, um, a lawyer or a DA um, as a prosecution person. Um, they do exist, and also the serial killers can be pretty much like the guy who is um, who is in that movie. But I know that because sometimes I talk to to. Uh, all types of offenders, including serial killers. But um, in general, the crime novels are very inaccurate because since Sherlock Holmes, in, in Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes is a chemist by profession. He's, he's not a policeman. He's not even a private detective, uh, strictly speaking. He's really a chemist. And his, uh, his big work is... Um, scientific work on ashes of, of cigars and cigarettes and so on. So I would call it a microscopic chemical work, something like that. Mm. So at that point, you did have the scientific criminalist or natural scientific criminalist. But in most of the cases, when authors ask me, either movie authors or crime novel authors or, you know, something in between or for TV and so on, or Netflix series, it always, it always gravitates towards an exciting emotional story. And even the, the novels that people think are very scientifically accurate, they just aren't. So, for example, one of the most, uh, the questions that I'm asked most often is that if maggots crawl northwards, that's out of a crime novel that was very famous, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago. And... Um, it took me a long time to understand why people ask me that very particular question. And <laughs> the reason was that the book was sold as if everything that is um, written in there on, on the scientific side is researched so well that it is completely correct. No? So, but my experience well, is a fiction is fiction. So can I ask the maggots? Are they affected by the light? Because a lot of insects are affected by light, right? So maybe this is where that came from because... Mm. You, exactly. You, yeah, you're right. Uh, the, they crawl northwards often because the sun, uh, in many cases, comes from from south uh, fr wards. Uh, but it is very unrealistic in reality because if you have a forest or if you have just a shade from from a shed somewhere or even from you know just a pile of wood standing somewhere, um, or especially in houses or apartments, uh, flats, where you have, um, let's say, a w the only window where the light gets through is in the west. Then the maggots may crawl to the east. Also, there's one type of maggot or maggots that crawl towards the light. So if you have that particular type of maggot, then <laughs> they, will, they will act uh, reversely. So really... By now, we just make things up. If the, if the crime authors come to me, I would always ask them, okay, where, where are you headed? What, what, what do you want with your emotional, interesting, you know, fantastic, <laughs> in, in the good sense, sorry. And then they would say, for example, okay, I need a beetle just because I like beetles. And if this beetle is, pulp, uh, you know, ground, grounded to powder, pulverized, and given to a person, then two days later, the person is supposed to get a heart attack, but survive that and then survive one day later out of a toxic shock. And then I'm like, OK, and then I take a Latin book and then we just make up a beetle, you know, like the in, in Latin. It sounds good. You know, the beetle with the late toxic shock, <laughs> something yeah. and six legs and then and everybody is happy. And I do this for now 20 years. So the first 10 years, I tried to make it realistic, but then I saw that it never made it into the, into the final versions. So we just make it up now. It's very transparent and open. Everybody knows that it's made up. And I'm just a service provider for, I don't know, some scientific sparkles that sound uh, <laughs> scientific. But so is, is, this, uh, is this also how you get money for what? <laughs> is this uh, part of your kiosk services? 
No, no, they don't. Um, I don't take money for that. It, it sometimes I make a very strict contract because they're trying. Uh, sometimes they try to use my personality inside of the novel because that happens sometimes, and then they make money out of that. So I just try to avoid that. But um, you, in, you in the German, your, you don't want your name attached to something that's not scientific. No, no, they, no, no. They can use my name and everything, but they they just uh, shouldn't make money out of it. So, for example, I, I can tell you an, an example. Yesterday, I signed a contract. It's a psychiatrist. He's very old. He has a lot of interesting cases. You know, let's say he's not, not very old, but let's say 75. He has some time now and he, he likes his patients. He's a good psychiatrist, but he, he also likes the psych psychological disorders and, the and you know, uh, dis I, I, disorders or let's say the, the interesting personality styles of people. And also he likes to write novels now. So he entered an academy for novel writing and then they said, yeah, but you know, some interesting scientific facts would be good because people like that in novels, you know, and ask Bineki. And then he asked me, okay, can I have you with your name in it? And I'm like, okay, as long as you only use it in that one first novel that comes out of your little crime academy and you're a friendly person, I like psychiatrists who like their patients. And um, so we are, you know, personally, that's good. But if this is ever going to be used in a movie, on merchandise, Mm -hmm. in a second novel for Netflix and so on, then we are out. So we had to set up a straight contract. But no, no, that, that's... Or if they ever pay something, then it's a symbolic fee, for example, just to make it... Uh, make the contract more sound. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. like 50, 50 symbolic euros or something <laughs> like that. Um, so, so you mentioned... Okay, so back to... I uh, asked you about... Uh, well, you, you said that... Um, there's a lack of resources when it comes to analysis. Um, so I imagine if if there's some percentage of uh, murders that are not solved, I'm guessing that's due to lack of analysis rather than lack of evidence. Um, but uh, is, is this to a certain extent due to the fact that we overly sanitize uh, death away out of our societies? It's not something we think about. Do, do you think we're, we're overly sanitized on this topic? I think it could easily uh, be solved even in a sanitized death environment because as long as we would have enough people who were pay you know well paid enough to collect the evidence we would be on the safe side because the cases that end up here in our office of of my my teams and my office are usually cases where the evidence was collected improperly mm -hmm. because somebody thought that this evidence is of no relevance. So it's more, so let's, let's say you, you would do it like the, the shotgun approach. You would say, okay, we pour some money into the education of crime collecting personnel. Let's say at the police. In other countries, that can also be at the DA's office or at the prosecution's office. In some countries, uh, they have it at the Institute of Legal Medicine or the Chief Medical Examiner's office or the, or the coroner's office. Um, so that, that's not a problem. The young people are interested. Um, if they have working hours that do not exceed, let's say, 45 hours per week, then they are in. Even though in Germany, for example, the, the daily, uh, the weekly working hours are 85, no, no, 38.5 hours. But even I, I think you could push it up to 45 because it's really interesting to, to collect evidence. Then if you, if you allow them to go like every two years to have a little in-house schooling to show them the latest techniques concerning, for example, our swabs, because the swabs are uh, getting better and better all the time. First, these were cotton swabs. Now they are made of polyester uh, mm -hmm. or also how to collect a single skin flake which is also very important, especially if the offender throws away the clothing of the victim and then it pours and rains on the clothing or it's in the forest and it's very dirty. Or another case that a colleague of mine had, somebody takes the clothing home for their own kids because they think, well, hey, this is good clothing. I mean, why not reuse it? And so on. And in those cases, a single skin flag can be very important. So if you do that, then you would have the evidence and you could store it very easily because most of the evidence can be stored at room temperature or let's say at, I don't know, 15 to 20 degrees Celsius. So you don't need advanced cooling at all uh, dry. So you just need a huge, relatively dry, relatively, you know, room temperature and below um, 
storing for storage facility and then you are good and then after a certain time you could say okay this is not a case this is an actual suicide this is an actual accident this is an actual case solved then you could throw out the evidence but this could easily be done and um, I think that's the only problem because the laboratories um, even the let's call them state laboratories or the laboratories who prefer to work for the prosecution side even they in that in those cases would get the evidence out of the storage facility of the DA's office so mm -hmm. then they would be happy and they're like okay no private people we are good <laughs> you know it comes from the official side so this could this is a typical case of um could easily be solved by money <laughs> money see. helps and, and I, I suppose people might think that it's not worthwhile to spend that money on this particular... I mean, people have no idea how many murders are not solved, right? So it, it might be difficult to convince people they want to spend money on this as opposed to education or uh, whatever other area. I don't know. And it's, I think the probably the biggest uh, part of, uh, of what could be understood much better would be sexual assaults, um, rape, and so on. Because in many cases, the situation is difficult. You see that with, the, um, with I don't know if you ever heard that, the, the huge global Me Too campaign. In, in many cases, they start to fight amongst each other because some people say, okay, I'm a real sexual assault case. You are just a faker who just, you know, when you were young, you tried to um, get money or something out of, you, you know, you traded sex for money or for influence or for a job. And now 20 years later, you're ashamed and so on and so on. So they, they all start to fight with, with each other. Or many cases, we also get these cases where especially females who are a little bit on the, on the, um, let's say on the shy side, let, mm -hmm. it's not an accurate description but let's call let's for now let's call it like that sometimes they endure sexual offenses of which that but they don't have a concept that this might be um, a power abuse or sexual offense mm -hmm. and i think what probably society might shy away from is the fact how very deeply rooted and how very widespread that is, especially inside of families, sexual assault, rape, um, things. I, I can give you an example um, how quickly the stains shed a very bright light on a super surreal um, situation. We, get, we got a case in which just a dildo or a vibrator was brought to us. And then we, we took the swabs and uh, checked for DNA. And the question was, did the father use the this uh, sex toy on one of the kids? So we expected probably a DNA mixture of the father and the kid or, you know, something like that, or only the father's DNA or only the kid's DNA. So, you know, everything is possible. Like I said, we don't think. But then we found the DNA of the whole family on the, on the sex toy. And we're like, hmm, that is kind of strange. But... Okay, what, what do we do? Okay, let's check which cells are these because is it from saliva? Is it from vaginal cells? Are these sperm heads? What is it? And this is where the problem starts. If you're just a DNA lab, then probably you just don't know what the cells look like microscopically. I'm old, I know that. So I can do a so-called Christmas stain, which is a, which is a very easy uh, type of staining the uh, cells on a, on a slide, on a little glass slide. And you do micros microscopy, you can take a photo of it and then later you can tell the jury or the court or whichever system you have. I saw the sperm head. I know it was a sperm head. It's not just any DNA from something, you know, any type of cell, but it's a sperm cell. Or I know it's a vaginal cell because I saw the vaginal cell. Here is the photograph of the vaginal cell and so on. So what came out at the end of the day was that the whole family was using the sex toy freely because the kids grew up in an environment where um, uh, touching your sexual organs, using sex toys, having sex with each other, you know, uh, was just normal for them. So juridically, obviously, that was sexual assault and whatnot. Yeah. But socially, it was normal for everybody in that family. And they also had sex with, sex, sex with each other. So um, if those things would be cleared up uh, stain-wise much, much more, then we would get a much better grip on prevention. Because, for example, if you ask the 10-year-old the, the daughter, 
then probably the teachers or whoever talks to talks to the kid would never like imagine to ask say does everybody in your family have sex with everybody and are you freely using sex toys without cleaning them and do you just you know store the sex toy in in you know in a cupboard where everybody knows where it is and you you can always take it and uh, i mean you would you wouldn't just imagine or dare to ask such a question but if we would get much much more information about that it would make it easier for everybody involved so we are not talking about uh, homicides here but about just social dysfunction <laughs> probably yeah. i guess it, it helps you know the questions to ask because if you ask Yeah, if you ask a girl, have you been assaulted? She may say no. But if you ask very specific questions like, did this happen to you? Did this person to, then you might get yeses where otherwise, if you hadn't known the questions to ask. Is this something that I imagine, uh, so at the start I said, uh, naively uh, as someone from the outside, I focus on the the grisly aspects of, of the job. But is this something that's really rewarding being able to, you know, have the chance to exonerate someone, have the chance to stop someone from murdering someone else? Is, is this something that, that sort of drove you into this uh, job at, in the first place? I'm mostly interested in stains. I'm, I'm just uh, like, the, you know, I had a checkerboard uh, square pattern shirt when I was younger and, and everybody was making fun of it. And I just didn't know. I'm like, what's wrong with checkerboard pattern shirts? So really, I just didn't understand it. And uh, also, <clears throat> obviously, I, I, I never did any um, sports in my life, except of rowing a little bit, but just for fun and so on. So I'm really the, the laboratory person. And I just grew into the field because I saw that the stains are so super helpful in cases where everybody is shouting and thinking and believing and having an opinion and and things are just going totally crazy. And you are in the middle, let's say in the eye of the storm, so to speak. And you're like, yeah, but we do have the stain here. This fiber tells us what happened. Why is everybody shouting and, and running around and crying and so on? So it, it just calms down in my in my world it makes the mm -hmm. world a little bit more calmer and more easy to understand and so on um rewarding i i think you you need the personality trait to know or to 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 be resistant to believing that you make the world a better place or anything the world is whatever it is mostly driven by economic uh, pressure And then also by other pressures, but economic pressure is probably the main uh, factor. And this is nothing that is in, within our reach. But we, we can, I mean, obviously we can only do what is within our reach. And my personal you know, interest is stains. For example, my, my colleague Tina, whom I mentioned before briefly, um, she's also a very good person. You can always ask her, Hey, we got a little bit of uh, stomach content from a, from a decomposed uh, or not, not fully decomposed from a dead person. And the police is asking questions about when was the last meal eaten because they do have witness statements. Mm -hmm. What would you like to check through the stomach contents? Um, even though they are thought because, you know, they were sent via postal service. It was warm. So then the ice melted, the ice packs melted and everything. And she would always just without thinking, she would always say, yeah, let's do it. So we set up our microscopes. And then we are we are in our little world and separating like oh look uh, this is this is a little bit fat, uh, of a fat droplet this is a type a piece of a vegetable this is a, a piece of bread hey wait a second haven't we seen the the bread crumb thing seed before okay let's start to count you know and from there it goes so and then we can sort we can count we can make the world calmer we we can do our thing <laughs> and then everything is peaceful so to be honest. We are not the good guys. We are just the nerdy guys. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like scientific medica meditation. or uh, It is. But, but so it, it sounds like a lot of what you do really is experience then. So you've in previous cases seen that seed or that you, you mentioned. Uh, is, is it just years of experience that allows you to determine these? Um, you, you, say, for example, I came to do training with you. Um How, how what would that training look like it, it, would you take me along to a scene or are we in a lab or, or how, how do you get this body of knowledge that you have uh, okay first of all it's better not to rely on your experience at all 
That, because that would be thinking. It would mean that I have experience and my experience has a value in this particular case. And that's already thinking. And in, in my lab, you would be out then. So everybody who claims who has experience with something, if it's technical experience, that's a different story. So if they tell me, okay, I know how to clean the microscope and how to make the light beams go in a particular way through the microscope because then we get a better, a sharper picture, so to say, then I'm okay. Show me if you can do that and that's a good thing. Or especially if people can take good photographs. That's something that is, it's horrible how bad the photographs are that, that we often get. But um, the trainings, we have different uh, trainings. So I wouldn't call it levels. I would just say these are different, like some spotlights or possibilities. So number one is if you're very young, let's say 13 or 14, then I would just take you out to the street. Uh, and then I just say, okay, look, here's a lamp pole or here is a phone booth because not, okay, booths don't exist anymore, but, but you know, like poles where a phone is still sitting to, and then you would say, why is there a phone? And then I'm like, okay, now we are talking. Okay. Why is there a phone? Very good question. Okay. Let's check what a, why is there a phone? Because nobody needs a, a phone on a pole. No, because if you're 13, you, this doesn't make sense to you. And like, Exactly. Good. Very good. So you are, you are not looking for, for blood and, and sperm and hair, but you are asking why is something happening? And now let's research it. Is the phone working? Do we have fingerprints on the phone? Um, is the phone functional? How does the phone work? Um, which type of stains do we see on the bottom of the phone? Is there grass? So nobody ever walks there, but also nobody cleans it, cleans the, the bottom of it and so on and so on. And then we can spend the rest of the day at the, whatever it is, you know, lamp, pole, phone, whatever it is. And then of course we also collect things and uh, make things visible with different light sources. Or we, you can, you can lift the, the fingerprints, the, not the genetic fingerprints, but the, the regular skin ridges and so on. Um, for the students age, let's say 15 to 25, we, if possible, we take them out, uh, for example, to uh, body worlds where they have a lot of human corpses, but wow. also a lot of unusual things. So then, for example, I would show them a, a case that I just had, let's say a cannibalism case or like anything that, that is, seems to be very strong and draws a lot of attention. And I'm like, Okay, and now forget that this is sensational and let's look at the stains. And um, before we do that, let's say um, you see a certain structure on a photograph. Let's say a person is decomposed and you have a certain pattern on the skin. Um, and then we're like, okay, wh where do you see these patterns and how, not, not, not kidding, how... Um, does that relate to the shape of whatever you find here at Body Worlds? So then they run around for two hours and then I come back and like, yeah, blood vessels look exactly like the pattern on the skin. It's so, okay. Now, does that come from blood vessels or is this by chance? Okay. Run around another hour. And then they're like, huh, all the branches in the trees have the same pattern. I'm like, aha, now we're talking. And then, like, okay, run around another hour. And then like, hmm, we found that rivers and, and mountains um, have, you know, seem to follow this, the same mathematical pattern. And so I'm like, see, okay. And now back to our case. So we always try to, to bring them away from what they think is important and then back. So they have some information about the case that may be of valuable or no. And then of course we have specialized trainings where we're just sitting five days in front of a microscope and look at insects from a decomposing material that we just, I, I just, you know, put it out somewhere and then they have to find out how long did the insects live on that um, decomposing material, which insects are these. Of course, I will mix insects that don't even live in Europe, for example, from Latin America <laughs> mm. amongst them, amongst the insects and so on. So it, it's from very much, don't, I mean, um, don't expect anything, don't make any assumptions to let's be very technical and everything in between. How long in your experience is it, do people become completely desensitized? I mean, you, you said you go to a body world where you, you have some bodies there and then you, you're uh, asking them to pay attention to specific things. Does that act in itself help to desensitize people to what, you know, um, what they're seeing in front of them? Is, is this something that takes months and years? Is this something that you still suffer from or...? or? No, no, it's interesting. Uh, it's again a character trait. You, 
um, I, I, I've seen students, when I went to the crime scene with the students, th th that was... Um, There was a certain time window, a few years, in which I could take the students to actual crime scenes. Now it's not allowed anymore. Um, ex I mean, at least not uh, in in um, the parts of Germany where I can easily travel to with the students. Um, in other parts of the world, it's, of, of course, it's no problem. Let's say in Mexico or something like that. I mean, where you have like <laughs> sometimes or in Colombia or in Vietnam or the Philippines where you have so many corpses that nobody cares, of course. But um um, you cannot get desensitized. I know that because, number one, when I took the students to the crime scenes, even, uh, or no, let's not say crime scenes, to the, to the um, places where we found a dead human person, most of them said, okay, I'm still interested in the stains and I will work in the laboratory in my future life, but I'm not going to enter a crime scene ever again because I don't want to see the social context. Mm -hmm. That's what happens in 99.9999% of cases. So I don't take the students anymore. Uh, now I have one single student who I think is ready for that because she has the character trait and she really straight away only looks at the details. Um, desensitization... Uh, is as far as I can see, even for experienced forensic workers, not possible because I was uh, there after 9-11 in Manhattan because I worked formerly at the Institute, like I said, uh, Chief Medical Examiner's Office, which was responsible for 9-11 because it was uh, the closest institute to um, 9-11. It was a terrorist attack in 2001 where many people died in Manhattan, in New York. And... Um, My colleagues were really, you know, we were very good on a very friendly level. And I came like a week or two afterwards just to, you know, just to talk to them and help them a little bit. And then we went out. And at that point, um, margaritas, that was a, a cocktail with, I, I don't know, I think like shaven ice and strawberries and vodka or something like that. And I ordered that for everybody. And I'm like, okay, you need to get a break We, you know, we get to the to the place that we've always been going after work. So let's go. And they were starting to cry when they saw the margaritas because they looked like the mashed and, and you know, like the persons that were smashed between the concrete plates and so on and so on at 9-11. And I was like, okay, so this is starting to get like probably post-traumatic. So let's better... Mm -hmm. um, keep them going and not so much try now to, to give them a little break because probably the break is not what they need right now. And then the second thing was that a colleague of mine from Dusseldorf, which is, um, like, I don't know, 500,000 person city in Germany where they do have cases, especially, uh, the invisible people cases, like decomposing people at home, like, a, like I said before, and they were at a mass grave in uh, the more Eastern parts of Europe. And, um, The, to my total surprise, these were people I knew f knew for years and they were dealing a lot with decomposition and, you know, 11-year-old kids killing themselves by jumping off the bridge. The worst traffic evident, um, accidents that you can imagine, like everything. Uh, elderly people raped, like 95-year-old person raped, uh, even though she, the person couldn't even talk anymore and had like a cathedral inside of the bladder and still the the um, man shoved the penis inside uh, vaginally inside of the person and so on so everything but that was too much because that out of the mass graves they got the jewelry and the clothing and then they were asked if they could talk to the relatives to identify these items to find out if which people were in the mass grave and after a few days they stopped they said okay we can either take our jewelry clothing etc out of the mass grave or talk to the relatives but not both so from from um, from things like this i think you really uh, have to have certain character traits that only few people have my colleagues have that in my in my team mm -hmm. um, they do have that for sure because i've seen it plenty of times and i i do have the same character trait too But most people don't, even in the field. So desensitization, as far as I can judge, is impossible and, and also not necessary. This is kind of interesting to me because, um, you know, I, I would imagine the people who are seeking this sort of an education are already, there's already been a filtration process. So you're dealing with people who already may have a better chance of, of dealing well, let's say, with, with uh, what others might just consider disgusting or, or emotionally difficult. 
and even then, uh, even then, you're running into this. Is um, I have something to the filtration. Just quickly, uh, I think there are so few people in our field, not only because of the money and so on, like I said before, but also because uh, nobody wants to do the job. So, so you're right. There is a filtration process. Totally. It's amazing that it's, it doesn't sound like it's much better paid then, if, uh, if this is a pro supply demand problem. Uh, yeah, but uh, we, I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm the only one who cert he's of, who's officially uh, certified in SWOT and I'm just not abusing my power here in that point because I could easily do that. I could like, like some of the lawyers, I could say, hmm, okay, before, like, especially in the United States, before we start working, I need 25,000 uh, US dollars or euros, or, you know, because that's just how much it costs. And, and that would be true. That would not even be a power abuse. But in my personal, just not professional, in my personal opinion, it is a power abuse because I'm the last resort. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's like the, like the, uh, these, these, um, um, stations at, at the Autobahn in Germany where the sweets that usually cost like 50 cents now cost 1 euro 50 because it's the only station providing you with uh, sweets and I don't want to be such a person it, but that's a personal thing so on on the topic of disgust I, I, so I know so are you, you're vegetarian or vegan 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 I, I, I was very curious uh, to ask you a very particular question so when when you consider the thought of eating meat does that disgust you no it's uh, it it's it's mostly for two reasons one is um i just very much dislike pain personally i'm i'm a total you know i don't want to say the word but <laughs> i I'm, I'm a very soft person when it comes to pain and also i'm one of the people who has like a very low pain threshold so when I go to, um, let's say, even if they, you know, if they just remove like a like, like dark spot on the skin or something like that, I really have to tell them, you must give me twice of whatever you inject. <laughs> and they're like, oh, God, another junkie, you know, and I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> it's the low <laughs> pain threshold. And uh, often you have to prove it to them. So so they start the operation and then it's on, let's say, on, on the back of, you know, on your back. And I'm like, OK, you're cutting from the top left to the bottom right now. And they're like, OK, fuck. We, we better <laughs> give him more of the anesthetic there, or local anesthetic. So that's the one thing. So I can very easily sympathize with all the rabbits and cows and sheep and whatnot because they are just held prisoner mm. in unspeakable conditions uh, and they are not free. I also like freedom a lot. So they are so, so very unfree. So that alone would be enough. But the second thing is that I... Um, also think it's very bad for our environment because we could free 80% of our land of on, on planet earth we could free 80% of the sweet water and also the salty water on planet earth we could solve uh, the whole co2 problem much much faster so um, it's it's out of the you know pain and freedom thing and the natural resources and mm -hmm. ec ecological network thing uh, but it's not so much discussed I've, I, it's more like I was, it's like if I would invite you over to dinner and then serve you stones, then probably you would not be disgusted, but you were just like, why? Why? I see, I see, I see. You, you, you see it as being the least sensible way of uh, giving ourselves nutrition, potentially. And, and it's bad for everybody else, exactly. So can I ask, um, one of the other people I, I should be interviewing soon uh, specializes in uh, developing insects for to replace uh, fish meal and for human consumption. Since you work specifically with uh, insects, for example, at the crime scene, would you be able to eat uh, insects, for example? Um, uh, there, there's an argument from the ethical side that uh, there's not as much suffering as, say, a, 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 you know, a cow or, or a pig. And on the environmental side, it's also, you know, 10 times um, better uh, in terms of the amount of protein uh, per resource that you need to develop that protein um, than, say, a cow. Would, would you be able there or...? I just gave a speech on that at the Congress for, the, for people who are trying to uh, do the insect breeding for food purposes. Um, I am completely against it because... Um, at the end of the day, whenever you, whenever you try to sideline 
the actual network of life that we have on Earth, like fungi, bacteria, plants, allegedly higher animals, water, e even temperature, everything that, that uh, plays a role there, it always ends up with a situation in which you have to use not in a negative sense, um, capitalistic uh, techniques. And I don't mean it this negatively because I'm not against capitalism. I just don't like that they want to earn more and more money out of it all the time. So let's say a soft, soft capitalism uh, would, would, would still be okay. Um, but if you use insect and in, insects in mass culture, and this is proven many times because this is the thing that's around for now, I don't know, maybe at least 10 to 20 years, it always ends up the same with shrimps, um, fish, of, of, of course, cows and everything else. You always have to use a lot of medication. Um, you, you are polluting the water much, much more than you want. So economically speaking, or even bioeconomically speaking, it may be 10 times less harmful, but it's still so very harmful to the, to the biosphere, to the, to, all the little strings and and um, influences that all living beings have amongst each other that it's it's still just a, a bypass that is typical for humans who overestimate how much they can manipulate nature mm -hmm. and this is proven many times so Whenever you start mass, cu mass culture of whatever it is, it doesn't work. I can even give you an example um, concerning plants. Because we in uh, in Germany, it's, there are still some people growing apples and uh, pears and so on. And even there, they found that even if you use insecticides, which they always do, <laughs> even if they claim not to do, and they want to do it biologically, then they they don't have a wild uh, like flowers and and whatever they call it um, amongst in the middle of those trees because they're like eh, we don't know then the the pears and the apples don't look perfectly and we cannot you know sell them easily in supermarkets but they started to uh, grow wild flowers and whatever wants to grow there a little bit outside of these uh, um, yeah um, i wouldn't call it mass mass production but like in not industrialized like um, civilized apple production and peer production and so on and they found that even then if they let a little bit wilderness grow just a little bit outside where it doesn't dis disturb um, the industrial process too much it even raises the amount of good apples and peers that you get so even there you can see that the more you allow nature to to re-establish those little strings that I was talking about before, you even uh, earn more money. That's what I meant with like a soft capitalism. You can work together with nature, but it won't work with mass, cu mass culture of insects. And I've seen many examples of that. The person you are going to interview is going to probably going to tell you some examples of that. How everything can collapse uh, within a few days and nobody knows why or how you um, still have to use antibacterial substances mm. but then this has a bad effect too because some of the insects um, live together with certain bacteria but you don't want to have them in your food out of a regulatory problem that comes from you know s some uh, office it's not working <laughs> escaped sapiens that was the first half of our conversation thanks for watching if you enjoyed that you can find the second half on my channel we discuss insects at crime scenes, psychopaths, the Epstein trial, and the newest forensic techniques. Check it out.